with that said, we're going to begin here in chapter 13 in uh, the Gospel of Mark at verse, at verse um, where is it? Okay, verse 14, and we'll get to verse 23, and we're going to be looking at that today. We're looking at what is called the Great Tribulation. So beginning at verse 14, Mark chapter 13, Jesus is speaking, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter. For in those days there will be tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, he's there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed, see, I have told you all things beforehand. Now, as we're in chapter 13, I have a tendency of giving you a little bit of a reminder. This won't be that long this time. But Jesus is answering a question that he had been asked by his men. He had said that the temple would be destroyed, and that had disturbed them. So when you combine the accounts from the Gospel of Mark and Luke and Matthew, we get a more full response. They had asked, when will these things be, and what is the sign when these things will take place and the end of the age? Well, in, in response, Jesus gave his longest answer recorded in the Gospels, and he outlined events that would precede his second coming, precede his return. He had said that there will be spiritual deception, that there'll be wars and earthquakes, that there'll be famines and plagues, and all of this will increase over time. In, in this chapter, in verse 8, he had said these are only what he said is the beginning of sorrows. And I mentioned to you that the word sorrows is a Greek word that speaks of severe agony. This is only the beginning of severe agony is what he's saying. But the word sorrow there in the Greek also speaks concerning birth pains. So wars and earthquakes, famines, plagues, he is saying, are only the birth pains. And like birth pains, they're clear indicators that there's more yet to come. Now, I mentioned that in our day we are seeing much of what he had prophesied come to pass. These are the things that are indicators that his return is certain and not far off. Now, he went on to give more details on the future period called the tribulation. That's a seven-year period that God is pouring out his wrath. His wrath is poured out on those who have rejected Jesus Christ worldwide. You see it, and we'll see this in a moment, described in more detail in, in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, chapter 6 through 19. Now, in this chapter, as we have already seen in, in verses 9 through 13, Jesus was speaking of a time of persecution. The tribulation will be a time of persecution. And, and as we looked at those verses, it would be found in four basic sources. There would be religious persecution, governmental persecution. You'll receive persecution from your own family and general societal persecution. And so he mentioned those things and spoke concerning those things and closed in verse 13 with a promise. He had said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now the word endure speaks of bearing up, holding fast. It's, it speaks of persevering under great pressure and trial. You see, a, a believer's real faith is evidenced by holding fast to the very end, no matter what. And so as we're looking at chapter 13, at this point, we've arrived at the uh, middle of what is called the tribulation. To set the stage for you a little bit, unbelieving Israel has been deceived by one called the Antichrist. Promises of peace have been made and believed a covenant has been signed. Now, we've all heard the name Antichrist. The word Antichrist actually has dual meaning. Anti can speak of 
against Antichrist, but it also speaks of instead of Christ. So the Antichrist is instead of Christ and against Christ. And this is a figure that is a, a coming uh, world ruler. And so Antichrist in Scripture uh, has, is going to make a covenant, an agreement uh, with the nation of Israel. We've already looked at some of that. I'm just reminding you of that. And as part of the, the uh, agreement, the covenant he makes will be the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. Now, there's a famous rabbinic scholar who lived around 1135 to 1204 A.D., and he had said that the temple will be built by Messiah himself and that its construction will be one of the signs that he is Messiah. And that may be part of how the Antichrist deceives the nation of Israel. But in the middle of the tribulation, Antichrist is going to break this covenant. He's going to demand worship in the temple and he's going to declare himself to be God. In verse 14, it says, when you see the abomination spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Well, Daniel the prophet is an Old Testament prophet. He obviously wrote the book of Daniel. In chapter 9, verse 27, this is what he said. Speaking of Antichrist, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. That word seven speaks of seven years. So he'll confirm a covenant with many for seven years. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Well, Matthew 24, 15 says, the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. So we have a description and a location. So it is standing in the holy place. This is an abomination of desolation. The word abomination speaks of something that is foul, something that is hated by God, something detestable. It can even be used to describe an idol. The word desolation means just that, devastation. The abomination that causes devastation is what is being referred to, something hated by God. But notice again in Matthew 24, 15, it reads that this is standing in the holy place. Now, when you're looking at a diagram of the ancient temple, it had what is called an outer court. It had a bronze basin. It had an altar of sacrifice. In it was a rectangular building divided into the holy place and the holy of holies. And so the holy place had a table of showbread. It was bread that was before. It's called also the bread of the presence, 12 loaves of bread that are there representing the nation of Israel. It had the lampstand because the nation of Israel was supposed to be at the light of the world. It had the altar of incense, which is speaking of prayer. These things represented Israel as the light of the world as well as prayer. And the temple emphasized the presence of God among his people. The temple was to demonstrate that God was always there and accessible. At the same time, the holy place and most holy place emphasized God's holiness and his inaccessibility due to the sins of the people. So there had to be sacrifice. There had to be things done in order for them to be able to enter into some form of relationship with him. But we know that Jesus is the bread of life. We know that he is the light of the world, and we know that he is the center of prayer. So by setting his throne in the holy place, Antichrist is declaring himself to be God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, Speaking of the Antichrist, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So Antichrist will enter the temple. He's going to demand worship, and that's going to catch Israel by surprise. You see, Israel had been experiencing peace for the first time. Even when you go to Israel to this day, they're really always on the alert, ready for attack, because the nation has to be that way in order to survive. At least that's what they think. They, they fail at this time to realize that God is, is sustaining them, but they're constantly on the alert. You will go through different places in Israel, and you will see young people, and they'll be carrying M16s everywhere. It's everywhere, on buses, everywhere. They're there. They're on the constant alert. But when Antichrist sets up this uh, covenant, this agreement, they're going to have peace for the first time in many, many years. 
But the Bible in 1 Thessalonians 5.3 says, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, they will not escape. The peace will be destroyed. Antichrist is going to declare himself to be God. He will start the second half of the seven-year period, and that second half, that three and a half years, is called great tribulation. The first th three and a half years are referred to as tribulation. The second, great tribulation. And what he'll do is he's going to initiate persecution against both Jewish and Gentile believers. In Revelation 13, 7 and 8, it says it was given power to wage war against God's holy people and, and to conquer them. It was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. You see, Jesus had said in verse 5, take heed that no one deceives you. Antichrist is going to be a political figure as well as a religious figure, and Antichrist is going to have a false prophet, the ultimate false prophet. There are many false prophets you see in the Old Testament, many false prophets that are named and false teachers in the New, but the false prophet at the end is going to be the worst of all of them. His religion, Antichrist religion, will be promoted by the most evil false prophet in history. In Revelation 13, 11 through 15, John said, I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. And so he's describing what is taking place in the second half. Notice in verse 14 how you all of a sudden see the words in parentheses, let the reader understand. That lets us know that what Christ is saying is actually for those who are going to be hearing later on. This is not for his men. If you look at your Bible, perhaps you have what are called red, red letter editions. The words of Christ are in red. If you have that, you'll notice that these words are not in red. They're, they're, they're just a regular black. That's what is called an interpolation. That is for Mark as he's writing in, in, by putting in parentheses. He's saying, this is for you. This is for you who are reading that let the reader understand. It's obviously not the men he's speaking to who had asked the original question. These, the things he's saying right now are for those who later will read this, which would include us in this room. So let the reader understand. These words are written for you who will read this. It's intended to help us to understand, especially those who are going through this time, to endure what is occurring. And so as he's speaking, he says, then in verse 14, let those who are in Judea, southern Israel, flee to the mountains. Judea speaks of, of the southern portion of Israel. You have the northern, central, and the southern. Judea is in the southern. Judea also is where Jerusalem is. And so he's saying, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, those living closest to the temple will be the first targets of Antichrist persecution. And so the word is flee, run for safety, take flight in order to escape danger. But not every Jew will be successful in escaping persecution. As a matter of fact, the Bible makes it clear, very few living in that area will survive. In the Old Testament book of Zechariah 13, verses 8 and 9, it says, In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver, test them like gold. They will call on my name. I will answer them. I will say they are my people. They will say the Lord is our God. So those who escape have come to faith in the true Messiah, Jesus. That trial, that time of trial is going to purge the nation. Zechariah 13, 9 said, this third I will bring into the fire. I'm going to refine them. I'm going to test them. 
The result is they're going to call on God. He's going to call them his people. They will call him their God. Again, in Zechariah 12, 10, God said this, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierce. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. There was a Bible teacher who was speaking to a former prime minister of the nation of Israel, and he read Zechariah 12, 10 and said, who is speaking here? And the answer from the prime minister was, well, that is God speaking. Because it says, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And so they said, well, that is God. God will pour on the house. So the second question that they asked is this. When it says they will look on me whom they have pierced, when did Israel pierce their God? And uh, the prime minister didn't want to answer. Why? Because they pierced their God when Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, when Jesus was crucified. The prime minister knew this was God speaking, but the question was asked, when did you pierce God? And they didn't want to answer. The prime minister did not want to answer because it pointed them to Jesus Christ. Those who survive will be purged. They will be what he calls my covenant people. Jeremiah 30, verse 11 says, I am with you, saith the Lord, to save you. Though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you. I will correct you in justice and will not let you go altogether unpunished. Now he said, I'm with you to save you. Make a full end of the nations where I have scattered you. The Jews had been scattered at the, uh, at the time of uh, the de uh, destruction of the temple. The Jewish people were scattered throughout the world. And you can go to many regions of the world today, and you can and often do encounter Jewish believers. It's interesting. There were Jewish believers in China, Jewish believers in India, there are Jewish believers in the African continent, here in the United States, everywhere. Marie and I, my wife and I, have gone to Israel a number of times. And, and on one occasion, we were in uh, Megiddo, a place called Megiddo. And, and as we're in this um, a souvenir shop, um, that's a form of purgatory for husbands, uh, souvenir shop. But as we're there in the shop, my wife comes walking up to me, Marie, and she says, honey, you got to come over here. And I said, oh, no. So I, I said, I lost my wallet. No, she wasn't asked for that. I said, okay. So I come walking to where she's at, and she's in one of the, uh, one of the areas of the shop. And she said, I'd like you to meet so-and-so. And she introduces, and she says to the man, tell him where you're from. And the man was from Mexico. He was a Mexican Jew. And so we spoke for a while and all. And so the whole thing is, is you will go to Israel, and, and there are stereotypes that people have. It, we've had them so many years, you know, caricatures of what a Jewish person looks like. I can tell you, I've seen Jews who are from Africa, from South America, from, you know, some of them are blondes with blue eyes. Others are very dark skinned, everything in between. And so God has allowed them to be scattered, but he's also regathering them. It, it, it's, the, the, it's when the, the fig tree began to, to, to blossom. They, they've returned since 1948. And so they've been coming slowly. They haven't fully come, but they're coming slowly. And the nation is being built up and all because the Lord did scatter them. But now he's beginning that regathering. Now, during this time, many non-Jewish Christians will be killed. It occurs to that ungodly persecution Mark 13, 10 had said the gospel must first be preached to all nations. So believers will be during the tribulation preaching the gospel and persecution continues to increase and many will be slaughtered. There'll be those who come to faith in Christ, but many will be slaughtered for their faith in Jesus, who is Messiah. Again, Revelation makes that clear. In Revelation 6, 9, and 10, it says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain 
because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? In Revelation 13, verse 7, it says, Antichrist was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer. That word conquer speaks of overcoming or prevailing and to, and to conquer them. Revelation 17, 6, I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony of Jesus. So the great tribulation that Jesus is speaking of here in this chapter, uh, you see the great tribulation beginning in the middle of that seven-year period. And he says, when these things are taking place, verse 14, he says, those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. There's going to be divine help. There will be protection provided for you. Now, he's referring to God preserving believers. God is going to provide a place of refuge for them. In Revelation 12, verses 1 through 6, as well as ver verses 13 and 14, there it speaks of Israel fleeing to a place prepared by God. In Revelation 12, verse 6 and verse 14, it says that she's taken care of for three and a half years. In Revelation 12, 14, it also says the woman, speaking of believers, was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time times and half a time that's three and a half years out of the serpent which is the devil out of the serpent's reach now many believe that this place that has been prepared for them is a place called petra that's in jordan in the book of isaiah chapter 16 verses 1 through 4 it reads send the lamb to the ruler of the land from selah which is petra to the wilderness to the mount of the daughter of zion for it shall be a wandering bird thrown out of the nest. So shall be the daughters of Moab. Moab is, is Jordan at the fords of the Arnon, which is a river. Take counsel, execute judgment. Make your shadow like the night in the middle of the day. Hide the outcasts. Do not betray him who escapes. Let my outcasts dwell with you, O Moab, O Jordan. Be a shelter to them. From the face of the spoiler, for the extortioner is at an end. Devastation ceases. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. Now, only a genuine believer in Jesus Christ is going to take him at his word. A genuine believer listens to what the Lord says, and a genuine Christian obeys. We know here in the United States that there is a large amount of people still to this day professing to be Christians. I was seeing just yesterday in a news report that back in like 1970s, uh, around 90 plus percent of Americans who were polled uh, concerning the religious faith would claim themselves to be Christians. It's gone down to the mid 60 percent in our time. There has been a recession and a regression of those who openly profess Christ. But still, the majority in our nation say they are Christian to this day. But only a genuine Christian is obedient to God. Those who profess to be Christians uh, and when they read something in Scripture or hear something they don't like, they reject it. Why? Because they're not really Christians. What they are are people who profess a certain thing, but when it comes down to obedience, they don't do that. You see, Jesus in John 14, 15 said, if you love me, keep my commandments. In John 15, 14, he said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. In the book of Luke, chapter 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So a person who claims Christ as a believer in Christ very often are simply saying that because they're not a Muslim or a Hindu or, or of some other faith. But in fact, a genuine Christian, a real Christian, is somebody who is hungry for the Word of God and somebody who is obedient to what it says. You see, we don't take the Bible and take out the portions of it we don't like because we don't agree with that. We take the whole counsel of God. We're to apply those things to our lives because that's how we're transformed. And that's how we demonstrate that we actually know God. There are millions who profess to know Christ who are ignorant of what he says. And when they are informed of what he says, they reject it. They say, oh, no, that's just a book. That's just that's for some other time. That was written for people of another age, but not today. But no, during this time, those who are fleeing the way he says are the genuine deal. They're the ones who are going and protected. The others are going to be slaughtered. Now, in verse 15, it says, 
Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. Now, when it says, let him who is on the housetop, in other words, it's an outdoor patio. He's got a roof there that he is seated in. Uh, don't go back. And, and get your material possessions. Why? Because no material possession is worth the risk of being caught and killed. You don't want to go back. Flee. Don't go back into danger. I was reading about a lady, an older woman, who, who was taking a shower, and her house was on fire. And when she, just, she could smell the smoke, and when she saw the flames, and so she just ran out. She didn't even grab a grab a towel. She just ran out straight from the shower into the street, and she was standing there on the sidewalk, naked. And as she's standing on the sidewalk, people from around were seeing the flames that were starting to come out of her house. And she turned, and she looked at them, and she ran back into the house. And she came running out a minute later, but this time she had her false teeth on. <laughs> Anyway, don't run back. That's, that's, that's actually, a, I think that's a true story. <laughs> but notice what it says in verse 17. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Obviously, mamas and pregnant women are not able to move quickly. And because of this, when they're caught, they will be violently murdered. In verse 18, pray that your flight may not be in winter. Again, in Jerusalem and in that surrounding area down there, that south, winters are normally fairly mild. Uh, the the uh, conditions, temperature and weather conditions in, um, in Israel are very similar to here. When we go on trips to Israel, people will say, what should I be dressed like? You know, is it going to be cold? Is it going to be hot? And we always say the same thing. California and Israel, the conditions are generally about the same. So the way you're dressing in California from here, uh, that's pretty much what it'll be like when you're in, in Israel. But it can get cold. And during the winter, it, it can be cold. I have a picture of my daughter, Anna, and me, and we were in Jerusalem, seat, we were sit, seated on, on some steps, and I have this uh, thick sweatshirt, and I have my hoodie over me, and she's got me by the arm, and she's pressed on me, and it was, it was snowing. So it can be severe sometimes, not, not always, but sometimes, and so winters can be severe. So pray that you, you're, you're, you're not fleeing during the winter, but he also speaks of the Sabbath, or on the Sabbath, because there may be some who are legalistic Jewish people who may hinder your flight. He says in verse 19, For in those days there will be tribulation such as not been, has not been since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. In those days. Again, Jesus is describing what Matthew referred to in Matthew 24, 21, as great tribulation. Matthew 24, 21 says, Then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. In the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 12, it says, There will be a time of distress, such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. Now, let me give you a little more information on this. The Great Tribulation is a series of escalating judgments revealing the wrath of God. It's clearly revealed in Revelation 6 through 19, and it has three escalating judgments, beginning with the seal judgments that lead to what are called the trumpet judgments, which take you to the bowl judgments. And the most intensive of the judgments are called the bowl judgments. You find that in Revelation 16. So there are seven bowls that are poured out containing the wrath of God. The first bowl that is poured out by an angel results in ugly festering sores breaking out on those who have the mark of the beast. The second is the angel turns the sea into blood, killing everything. The third is an angel dries up the rivers and spring, rather the rivers and springs due to the angel are turned into blood. 
Then the sun scorches people with intense heat. The fifth is when Antichrist's kingdom is plunged into darkness. People are gnawing their tongues in pain. The sixth bowl is the Euphrates River dried up. It prepares for the kings of the east. Demonic spirits are performing signs. They go out to the kings of the world. They gather them for Armageddon. And then the seventh is lightning and thunder. The worst earthquake that has ever been on earth will occur. Cities will collapse. Mountains will move. There will be a hundred pound hailstones killing people. Babylon will be destroyed. And it ends with Jesus returning. Hundred pound hailstones. We were in Indiana at a pastor's conference. And they had a hailstorm. Now, we Californians, we have them. And the hailstones I've seen here in California are small. They're not very large. But these were the size of golf, golf balls. And it was, you know, hitting and denting all the cars that were in the parking lot. And just think about that. They probably weighed a few ounces. These are 100 pounds. It's going to be leveling everything. That's the picture. And so it says, unless those, in verse 20, those days were short, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake. Now, the elect's sake is both Jewish and Gentile believers. The, the earth will not be totally annihilated. God is going to show mercy to the elect. See, the tribulation has a set amount of time, and then it comes to a conclusion. In Isaiah 1, verse 9, it says, unless the, the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. In Habakkuk 3, verse 2, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath. Remember mercy. It's going to come. It's going to be terrible. But the cry out is, God, in your wrath, as you're pouring it out, remember mercy, which the Lord did by sending his son Jesus to set us free from sin and also to remove us from this time that's going to come. That those who have refused him will go into that. There'll be people who have gone to church just like this, many churches throughout this land and throughout the world, who have preached and shared and said, guys, come to faith in Christ. You need to know him. He'll forgive you of your sins. He'll cleanse you of your, your unrighteousness. He'll give you hope. He'll give you peace. All you need to do is, is, is come to him and, and you can have joy. We share that because that's what Jesus Christ promised to give us. But people refuse it. They say, no, I don't, I'll just wait. I, I don't believe this. this is a myth. This is a story. This doesn't make any sense. But we say, well, look around you right now. In your lifetime, have you ever seen it this way? Where you go to places and, and you're told these things. Your kids go to school and you hear certain things that you don't teach. And how odd is God? You don't see that? No, that's just progressive. No, that's degressive. That's digressive. That's regressive. That's destructive is what it is. But people don't see it, right? So it's no big deal. But it's coming. And it's going to come and it's going to be sudden. I was a little guy nine or ten years old. I grew up in Norwalk. And I was on the bunk bed in my bedroom. My brother had the lower bunk. I had the top bunk. And I was just, just kind of laying there reading a comic book or something when the whole house shook. It, it shook so badly that I actually fell off the bed onto the floor. I was knocked off the bed and I hit the floor. So my mother comes running from the front room, which is just right there, and she says, David, are you jumping? You know, what are you doing? I said, Mom, I got knocked off the bed. And she says, and she, you know, she's looking at me, come on. Well, what had happened, and some of you, I don't know how many of you would remember this. Perhaps some of you are old enough to. Two planes collided in Norwalk over our house, based, uh, not directly over, but about a mile away from our house, two planes had collided and it exploded. And the explosion and all that happened was so severe that the ground actually moved and I fell off the bed. And I went, my father and I stood outside and looked into the sky and we saw a ball of flame that was coming down one of the planes. One of them landed on the sheriff's substation there in Norwalk. A lady had stepped out to look what was going on. And she had been killed. Suddenly, without notice, she stepped out 
heard the sound the way I did, the way my dad did, stepped out and she was killed. Something landed on her and killed her that fast. You never know. You never know when your moment is. And for those who think that tomorrow is promised to them, they're thinking wrong because you never know. I, I, when I was a kid, you know, and I was going into the things of the world and drinking and doing the drugs and all of that, what started, started to wake me up was I started losing friends. One friend got shot in the head across the street from my house. Another friend got stabbed to death at a tasty freeze by Santa Fe High School. Another friend of mine was drinking, taking some drugs, dropped some acid, and the thing about him is I had seen him earlier that day. His name was Dave Smith, and I was at the Tasty Freeze across the street from Sierra High School, and, and I, he was a friend of mine. We'd known each other through high school. We had graduated. I hadn't seen him for a while, but there he is, and I noticed him but didn't say anything, and I was walking and about to leave when I still remember Dave calling out my name. He said, Dave, and I turned and I looked at him. He said, I'll see you later. And I went like that, yeah, I'll see you later. Well, that night, he got on his motorcycle. He was loaded and drunk, and he hit the back of a parked pickup truck. He, his face went into the corrugated bumper, and he was killed instantly. I started seeing these things, people that I partied with, people that I was friends with. I used to deliver flowers for a place called Whittier Florist, and I would go to Rose Hills, and I would take funeral wreaths and place them on on uh, caskets, and I still remember reading the, the name on the card, and it, it was a familiar name, but just the week before, he and I had been in, in a Quonset hut there in, in, uh, in Santa Fe Springs, he and I and a couple of guys, we had been partying, smoking pot, and, and all of that, he's somebody I partied with, and I'm looking at his name, and I'm saying, oh, that can't be him, he's only 18 years old, and I go and I drop the flowers off, I put them on top of the casket, and I look into the face of a friend of mine that just a week before had been smoking dope with me. I started seeing these things. See, you never know when you're going to be dying. You don't know when that's going to happen. You have to be ready. Jesus is preparing, but preparing us, he's saying, he's saying, you need to understand. People say, no, this ain't, this will never happen. Never happened. It's just a myth. It's just a story. Or really, the pestilence that you see today, that's just a story. Yeah, the earthquakes that are, are growing in, in, in numbers and, and in severity, that's just the plagues that we see, those things, and, and the famines, those, those are all things that are just normal. No, those are things that are escalating. Those are things that are waking us, waking us up to the fact that Christ is true to his word. And that's why it said, let the reader understand. See, we are living not in that time that's being described here, but the time just Prior to that, there's an event going to take place called the rapture. We're going to be taken out of this place. The Lord is going to call us up. We'll be with him. But there'll be people behind, left behind. And they'll be going, I heard this. I, went to ch I, th I thought that was a joke. It's not a joke. It's a real deal. And that's why the Lord is speaking to that. And God shows mercy in your wrath, he says. Remember mercy. He says in verse 21, then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, he's there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. False prophets will be on the rise. Many have fled into the mountains while hiding they hear rumors that Christ has returned. But the false prophets are there, especially this one false prophet, the worst of them all. The false prophet begins to perform miracles in an attempt to draw people out. Revelation 13, 13 and 14 says, he performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. For for those reading this, do not listen, he said, to the false prophets. In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, Paul said, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. 
You see, under the incredible pressure, they greatly desire to be with Jesus. But this is Satan's last effort to destroy them. But he will fail to deceive the genuine believer. As notice it says, he says, false Christ and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But the elect will not be deceived. That's how strong the delusion is, though. And then he finally says, take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. I have prepared you. I have told you beforehand. You are not without warning. Those who know and believe his word are not going to fall into that trap. Psalm 91 verse 2 says, I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him I will trust. Psalm 119 verse 50 this is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has given me life. A genuine believer in Christ during that day will not be deceived because the truth has set them free. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. But until that moment, the Lord is still calling people out to himself. Still calling people to himself. And there may be some in this room or watching online right now who have yet to get right with God. These things are true. If you don't embrace them and say, God, help me to understand these things, you may very well go through those things that are being declared here. It is better for you to say, Jesus, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. Forgive me. I need your help. Perhaps today is the day you should do that. Our Father, we ask.